section fifty nine of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifty nine a visit to a lama by pere gerbillon among the tartars the priests of buddha are all called lamas but are of greatly differing rank the editor our ambassadors upon their coming into the town went directly to the chief pagoda several lamas coming to receive them and to conduct them across the square court quite large and well paved with square tiles to the pagoda where was one of their chiefs he was one of those whom the impostors say never die they affirm that when his soul is separated from his body it immediately enters into that of a new-born child the veneration which the tartars have for these impostors is incredible even worshipping them as gods upon earth i was witness of this respect which our ambassador and a part of his retinue particularly the mongols paid him the person who then pretended to be thus brought again into life was a young man about twenty-five years old his face was very long and rather flat he was seated under a canopy at the farther end of the pagoda upon two cushions one of brocade and the other of yellow satin a large mantle of the finest chinese yellow damask covered his body from head to foot so that nothing of him could be seen but his head which was quite bare his hair was curled his gown edged with a sort of party-coloured silk lace four or five fingers broad much as our church copes are and which the mantle of this lama was not much unlike all the civility which he showed the ambassadors was to rise from his seat when they appeared in the pagoda and to continue standing the whole time he received their compliments or rather adoration the ceremonial was as follows the ambassadors when they were five or six paces distant from the lama first veiled their bonnets to the very ground then prostrated themselves thrice striking the ground with their foreheads after this adoration they went one after the other to kneel at his feet the lama put his hands upon their heads and made them touch his bead roll or string of beads after this the ambassadors retired and made the same adoration a second time then they went to sit down under canopies got ready on each side the counterfeit god being first seated the ambassadors took their places one on his right hand and the other on his left some of the most considerable mandarins seating themselves next to them when they had sat down the people of their retinue came also to pay their adoration to receive the imposition of hands and to touch the bead roll but there were not many there who had this respect shown them in the meantime there was tartarian tea brought in in large silver pots with a special one for this pretended immortal carried by a lama who poured it out for him into a fine china cup which he reached himself from a silver stand that was placed near him the motion he at that time used opened his mantle and i observed that his arms were naked up to the shoulders and that he had no other clothes under his mantle but red and yellow scarfs which were wrapped round his body he was always served first the ambassador saluted him by bowing the head both before and after drinking tea according to the custom of the tartars but he did not make the least motion in return to their civility a little after a collation was served up a table being first set before this living idol then one was set before each of the ambassadors and the mandarin who attended them per Pereira and i had also the same honour done us there were upon these tables dishes of certain wretched dried fruits and a sort of long thin cakes made of flour and oil which had a very strong smell after this collation which i had no inclination to taste of but with which our tartars and their attendants were very well entertained tea was brought a second time 
a little after the same tables were brought in covered with meat and rice there was upon each table a large dish of beef and mutton half dressed a china dish full of rice very white and clean and another of broth and some salt dissolved in water and vinegar the same sort of meat was set before the attendants of the ambassadors who sat behind us what surprised me was to see the great mandarin devour this meat which was half dressed cold and so hard that having put a piece into my mouth only to taste it i was forced to turn it out again but there was none played their part so well as two calchas tartars who came in whilst we were at table having paid the adoration to and received the imposition of hands from the living idol they fell upon one of these dishes of meat with a surprising appetite each of them taking a piece of flesh in one hand and his knife in the other and cutting unusually large slices after which they dipped them in the salt and water and swallowed them down all being taken away tea was brought once more after which there was quite a long conversation the living idol keeping his countenance very well i don't think that during the whole time we were there he spoke more than five or six words and that very low and only in answer to some questions which the ambassadors asked him he kept continually turning his eyes around and staring very earnestly on each side and sometimes smiling there was another lama seated near one of the ambassadors who kept up the conversation probably because he was the superior for all the other lamas who waited at table as well as the servants received orders from him after a short conversation the ambassadors arose and went about the pagoda to take a view of the paintings which are very coarse after the manner of the chinese there is not a statue in it as in other pagodas only figures of the deities painted on the walls at the bottom of the pagoda there is a throne or sort of altar upon which the living idol is placed having over his head a canopy of yellow silk and here he receives the adoration of the people on the sides there are several lamps though we saw but one lighted going out of the pagoda we went upstairs where we found a wretched gallery with chambers on all sides of it in one of them there was a child of seven or eight years old dressed and seated as a living idol with a lamp burning by him it was probable this child was designed one time or other to succeed the present idol for these deceivers have always one ready to substitute in the place of another in case of death and feed the stupidity of the tartars with this extravagant notion that the idol comes to life and appears again in the body of a young man into whom his soul passed this is the reason for their so great veneration for the lamas whom they not only implicitly obey in all their commands but make them an offering of the best of everything they have and therefore some of the mongols of the ambassador's retinue paid the same adoration to this child as they had done to the other lama this child did not make the least motion nor speak one single word we found also in another chamber a lama singing his prayers written upon leaves of coarse brown paper when our curiosity was satisfied our ambassadors took leave of this impostor who neither stirred from his seat nor paid them the least civility after which they went to another pagoda to visit another living idol who came to meet them the day before but per pereira and i returned to the camp End of section fifty nine this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia Section sixty of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. China, Part Nine, the first two centuries of Manchu rule. Historical note. By the fourteenth century, the kingdom founded by Kublai Khan had fallen to pieces, and China was once again ruled by native sovereigns. The Tartars still harassed the frontiers, however and in 1644 the warlike manchus were called in to defend the kingdom against them they entered it as conquerors and established a manchu dynasty that ruled until the revolution of 1912 meanwhile several nations were seeking commercial privileges 
portugal holland russia and england were all eager to extend their trade russia met with favor but england's attempt to make the country into a market for her indian opium aroused the just wrath of the chinese they seized some twenty million dollars worth of the drug and destroyed it war followed by the treaty which closed the war five ports were thrown open to all nations one year later in eighteen forty four the united states signed a treaty with china but the hatred of the chinese for foreigners made the privileges that the americans had won of comparatively small value the chinese had never been content under their manchu rulers and in eighteen fifty a formidable revolt broke out against them in southern china the taiping rebellion as it was called lasted for fourteen years but was finally suppressed by general gordon who was given command of the imperial army in eighteen seventy three the chinese emperor for the first time gave a personal audience to foreign envoys without obliging them to kowtow or pay him homage thus admitting the equality of other nations and putting an end to the old policy of isolation end of section sixty this recording is in the public domain Section 61 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. The World's Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tapan section sixty one the coming of the kalmucks by thomas de quincey seventeen seventy one a d in sixteen sixteen a tartar tribe the torgotes or kalmucks left china and went to the shores of the caspian sea the russian rule however finally became so unbearable that in seventeen seventy one the descendants of these people determined to return to china there were six hundred thousand of them men women and children their flight began in the winter for thousands of miles they waded through deep snow they crossed rivers they fought hostile tribes who pursued them like demons they suffered from famine and from cold and heat of the six hundred thousand one hundred and forty thousand had died when at last they drew near to the great wall the following extract describes their approach the editor on a fine morning of early autumn of the year seventeen seventy one kien long the emperor of china was pursuing his amusements in a wild frontier district lying on the outside of the great wall for many hundred square leagues the country was desolate of inhabitants but rich in woods of ancient growth and overrun with game of every description in a central spot of this solitary region the emperor had built a gorgeous hunting lodge to which he resorted annually for recreation and relief from the cares of government led onwards in pursuit of game he had rambled to a distance of two hundred miles or more from his lodge followed at a little distance by a sufficient military escort and every night pitching his tent in a different situation until at length he had arrived on the very margin of the vast central deserts of asia here he was standing by accident at an opening of his pavilion enjoying the morning sunshine when suddenly to the westward there arose a vast cloudy vapour which by degrees expanded mounted and seemed to be slowly diffusing itself over the whole face of the heavens by and by this vast sheet of mist began to thicken toward the horizon and to roll forward in billowy volumes the emperor's suite assembled from all quarters the silver trumpets were sounded in the rear and from all the glades and forest avenues began to trot forwards towards the pavilion the jaegers half cavalry half huntsmen who composed the imperial escort 
conjecture was on the stretch to divine the cause of this phenomenon and the interest continually increased in proportion as simple curiosity gradually deepened into the anxiety of uncertain danger at first it had been imagined that some vast troops of deer or other wild animals of the chase had been disturbed in their forest haunts by the emperor's movements or possibly by wild beasts prowling for prey and might be fetching a compass by way of re-entering the forest grounds at some remoter point secure from molestation but this conjecture was dissipated by the slow increase of the cloud and the steadiness of its motion in the course of two hours the vast phenomenon had advanced to a point which was judged to be within five miles of the spectators though all calculations of distance were difficult and often fallacious when applied to the endless expanses of the tartar deserts through the next hour during which the gentle morning breeze had a little freshened the dusty vapour had developed itself far and wide into the appearance of huge aerial draperies hanging in mighty volumes from the sky to the earth and at particular points where the eddies of the breeze acted upon the pendulous skirts of these aerial curtains rents were perceived sometimes taking the form of regular arches portals and windows through which began dimly to gleam the heads of camels endorsed with human beings and at intervals the moving of men and horses in tumultuous array and then through other openings or vistas at far distant points the flashing of polished arms but sometimes as the wind slackened or died away all those openings of whatever form in the cloudy pall would slowly close and for a time the whole pageant was shut up from view although the growing din the clamours the shrieks and groans ascending from infuriated myriads reported in a language not to be misunderstood what was going on behind the cloudy screen these were the kalmuks pursued by their savage enemies the emperor had known that they were coming but he had no reason to expect them for at least three months by the clangour of weapons and the cries of agony he knew what was happening he summoned the cavalry and artillery that always guarded him and the wretched wanderers were soon free from their foes food and clothes and money and land and cattle and agricultural implements were already provided for them on the margin of the desert great columns of granite and brass were afterwards reared with the following inscription telling the story of this flight the editor by the will of god here upon the brink of these deserts which from this point begin and stretch away pathless treeless waterless for thousands of miles and along the margins of many mighty nations rested from their labours and from great afflictions under the shadow of the chinese wall and by the favour of kien long god's lieutenant upon earth the ancient children of the wilderness the torgote tartars flying before the wrath of the grecian czar wandering sheep who had strayed away from the celestial empire in the year sixteen sixteen but are now mercifully gathered again after infinite sorrow into the fold of their forgiving shepherd hallowed be the spot for ever and hallowed be the day september eighth seventeen seventy one amen end of section sixty one this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia Section 62 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March, Japan. Section 62. 
Chinese Punishments by Per Duhald. No crimes pass unpunished in China. The bastinado is the common punishment for slight faults, and the number of blows is proportionable to the nature of the fault. This is the punishment which the officers of war immediately inflict upon the soldiers who, being placed as sentinels in the night time in the streets and public places of great cities, are found asleep. When the number of blows does not exceed twenty, it is accounted a fatherly correction, and not an infamous. The emperor himself sometimes commands it to be inflicted on great persons, and afterwards sees them and treats them as usual. A very small matter will incur this correction, as having taken a trifle, said opprobious things, given a few blows with the fist. If these things reach the Mandarin's ears, he immediately sets the batoon at work. After the correction is over, they are to kneel before the judge, bow their bodies three times to the earth, and thank him for the care he takes of their education. The instrument wherewith he inflicts the bastinado is a thick cane, cloven in two, and several feet long. The lower part is as broad as one's hand, and the upper is smooth and small, that it may more easily be managed. It is made of the bamboo, which is a wood that is hard, strong, and heavy. When the mandarin sits in judgment, he is placed before a table upon which is a case full of small staves, about half a foot long and two fingers broad, and he is surrounded with tall footmen with batoons in their hands. At a certain sign that he gives by taking out and throwing down these staves, they seize the criminal and lay him down with his face towards the ground, and as many small staves as the mandarin draws out of the case and throws on the ground, so many footmen succeed each other every one giving five blows with a batoon on the guilty person's bare skin. However, it is observable that four blows are always reckoned as five, which they call the grace of the emperor, who as a father has compassion on the people, always subtracting something from the punishment. There is another method of mitigating the punishment, which is to bribe those that apply it, for they have the art of managing in such a manner that the blows shall fall very lightly and the punishment become almost insensible. It is not only in this tribunal that the Mandarin has power to give the bastinado. It is the same thing in whatever place he is, even out of his district, for which reason, when he goes abroad, he has always officers of justice in his train who carry the batoon. As for one of the vulgar, it is sufficient not to have alighted if he was on horseback when the mandarin passed by, or to have crossed the street in his presence to receive five or six blows by his order. The performance of it is so quick that it is often done before those who are present perceive anything of the matter. Masters use the same correction to their scholars fathers to their children, and noblemen to punish their domestics, with this difference that the batoon is every way less. Another punishment, less painful but more infamous, is the wooden collar, which the Portuguese have called cangue. This cangue is composed of two pieces of wood, hollowed in the middle, to place the neck of the criminal in. When he has been condemned by the mandarin, they take these two pieces of wood, lay them on his shoulders, and join them together in such a manner that there is room only for the neck. By this means, the person can neither see his feet nor put his hand to his mouth, but is obliged to be fed by some other person. He carries night and day this disagreeable load, which is heavier or lighter according to the nature of the fault. Some kangus weigh two hundred pounds and are so troublesome to criminals that out of shame, confusion, pain, want or nourishment and sleep, they die under them. Some are three feet square and five or six inches thick. The common sort, 
weigh fifty or sixty pounds the criminals find different ways to mitigate the punishment some walk in company with their relations and friends who support the four corners of the kangwe that it may not gall their shoulders others rest it on a table or on a bench others have a chair made proper to support the four corners and so sit tolerably easy when in the presence of the mandarin they have joined the two pieces of wood about the neck of the criminal they paste on each side two long slips of paper about four fingers broad on which they fix a seal that the two pieces which compose the kangwe may not be separated without its being perceived then they write in large characters the crime for which this punishment is inflicted and the time that it ought to last for instance if it be a thief or seditious person or a disturber of the peace of families a gamester etc he must wear the kangwe for three months in a particular place the place where they are exposed is generally at the gate of a temple which is much frequented or where two streets cross or at the gate of the city or in a public square or even at the principal gate of the mandarin's tribunal when the time of punishment is expired the officers of the tribunal bring back the criminal to the mandarin who after having exhorted him to amend his conduct frees him from the kangwe and to take his leave of him orders him twenty strokes of the batoon for it is the common custom of the chinese justices not to inflict any punishment unless it be a pecuniary one which is not preceded and succeeded by the bastinado inasmuch that it may be said that the chinese government subsists by the exercise of the batoon besides the punishment of the kangwe there are still others which are inflicted for slight faults a missionary entering into a tribunal found young people upon their knees some bore on their heads a stone weighing seven or eight pounds others held a book in their hand and seemed to read diligently among these was a young married man about thirty years old who loved gaming to excess he had lost one part of the money with which his father had furnished him to carry on his business exhortations reprimands threatenings proved ineffectual to root out this passion so that his father being still desirous to cure him of this disease conducted him to the mandarin's tribunal the mandarin who was a man of honour and probity hearing the father's complaint caused the young man to draw near and after a severe reprimand and proper advice he was going to have him bastinadoed when his mother entered all of a sudden and throwing herself at the mandarin's feet with tears in her eyes besought him to pardon her son the mandarin granted her petition and ordered a book to be brought composed by the emperor for the instruction of the empire and opening it chose the article which related to filial obedience you promise me he said to the young man to renounce play and to listen to your father's directions i therefore pardon you this time but go and kneel in the gallery on the side of the hall of audience and learn by heart this article of filial obedience you shall not depart from the tribunal till you repeat it and promise to observe it the remainder of your life this order was exactly put in execution the young man remained three days in the gallery learned the article and was dismissed there are some crimes for which the criminals are marked on the cheek and the mark which is impressed in a chinese character signifying their crime there are others for which they are condemned to banishment or to draw the royal barks this servitude lasts no longer than three years as for banishment it is often perpetual especially if tartary is the place of exile but before they depart they are sure to be bastinadoed and the number of blows is proportionable to their crime unless in some extraordinary cases which are mentioned in the body of the chinese laws 
or for which the emperor permits immediate execution upon the spot no mandarin or superior tribunal can pronounce definitively the sentence of death the judgments of all crimes worthy of death are to be examined decided and subscribed by the emperor the mandarins send to court the account of the trials and their decision mentioning the particular law on which their sentence is founded for instance such a one is guilty of a crime and the law declares that those who are convicted of it shall be strangled for which reason i have condemned him to be strangled these informations being come to court the superior tribunal of criminal affairs examines the fact the circumstances and the decision if the fact is not clearly proved or the tribunal has need of fresh information it presents a memorial to the emperor containing the proof of the crime and the sentence of the inferior mandarin and it adds to give a just judgment it seems necessary that we should be informed of such a circumstance therefore we think it requisite to refer the matter to such a mandarin that he may clear up the difficulty that lies in our way the emperor gives what order he pleases but his clemency always inclines him to do what is desired that a man's life may not be taken away for a slight cause and without sufficient proof when the superior has received the information that it required it presents a second time the deliberation to the emperor then the emperor either confirms the sentence or diminishes the rigor of the punishment sometimes he sends back the memorial writing these words with his own hand let the tribunal deliberate further upon this matter and make their report to me every part of the judicature is extremely scrupulous when a man's life is concerned end of section sixty two this recording is in the public domain Section 63 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Monica M.C. The Temple of Heaven, Peking, Photograph, page 186 It has been rather unkindly declared that China has no architecture. However that may be, she has certainly some extremely interesting buildings. The most peculiar of these are the pagodas, or tars, as the Chinese call them. These are high, tapering towers, built in stories, each story with a projecting roof. Generally, these roofs have an appearance of sagging like an awning or a tent. Light bells are hung upon them, which tinkle in the breeze. The towers are made of brick, covered with either marble or glazed tiles. Some of these structures are thirteen stories in height. The temples are built on the same general plan, but have pavilions for idols, rooms for priests, and enclosures for animals to be used in sacrifice. The Temple of Heaven at Peking, with its triple roof and deep blue porcelain tiles, is the most imposing of all Confucian temples. Here the Emperor of China was wont to offer sacrifice every 22nd of December and also whenever drought or famine called for the special favor of the god Shang-Ti. The dwellings of the Chinese must by law correspond to the rank of the owners. A common plan is to make the house about four times as deep as it is wide, with a broad passage from the front to the dining room, which runs across the house in the rear. The kitchen is behind this. The larger rooms may at a moment's notice be divided by movable partitions, which are always kept ready. The Chinese begin a building by first making a roof supported by wooden posts. As the walls are built, these posts are removed. End of section 63. This recording is in the public domain. Section 64 of China, Japan, and 
the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke why the chinaman wears a queue by william elliot griffiths the mark of nationality among these northeastern tartars the manchus was the queue they shaved the whole front of the scalp and then let their hair grow behind into a long tail a young manchu warrior was as proud of his tail of hair as a mohawk or pawnee indian was of his scalp lock before this time the chinese wore their hair as the koreans do that is done up in a sort of knot or chignon at the back of the head thus it happens that chinese on first coming to korea are amused at seeing the fashion of top knots prevalent just as it was among their ancestors of the ming period if short by nature the queue was lengthened out by means of black silk or false hair so as to reach below the knees in china this queue became the solemn mark of loyalty to the manchu sovereign millions of natives were slaughtered before they would submit their heads to the razor although chinese males wash their own clothes being laundry men by habit they do not shave themselves but pay for their tonsure to the manchus the barbers of china are very grateful until our twentieth century in china not to wear the queue or to cut it off was a sign of disloyalty to the emperor some of the anti-dynastic secret societies showed their enmity to the peking rulers by secretly snipping off the queues of prominent citizens or men high in office thus bringing disgrace and shame upon them nevertheless the chinese are not peculiar in priding themselves on their hair tails for it was the fashion with europeans and americans in the eighteenth century to wear them most of the continental soldiers and sailors in the revolution had pigtails which they larded powdered or wore in eel skins looking just as funny as do the chinese in every country in the world there is a language of hair the fashions of hair and headgear serve as signs of nationality sex marital promise or condition the japanese however cut off their top knots in eighteen seventy the koreans two decades later and the chinese are now slowly following the example of the world at large in china whether with or without hair tails the men follow a uniform fashion but there is an amazing variety among the women in arranging their tresses when the manchus appeared before the oft besieged and many times captured city of lao yang the people submitted to their new masters giving signs of their sincerity by shaving the front part of their scalps and waiting for their cues to grow End of section sixty four this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section sixty five of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section sixty five how the chinese received the first english ambassador by charles gutzloff seventeen ninety two a d for many centuries china had little intercourse with other countries various european nations tried to form commercial relations with her and there was buying and selling between them but it was most unsatisfactory the rules made by the chinese were as fickle as the wind often the merchants or foreign devils as the chinese call them were in danger of their lives 
several nations had sent representatives to china and in seventeen ninety two england decided to send lord macartney as an ambassador to the emperor in the hope of establishing safe and reasonable relations of trade even before the ambassador landed the tricky chinamen contrived to run up a flag on the vessel that bore him up the pai ho whereon was written tribute bearer from england this was quite in accordance with the chinese custom of claiming all gifts as tribute another custom of theirs was that whoever approached the throne of the emperor must perform the kowtow that is must kneel three times and at each kneeling must bow three times till his head touched the floor this was the way in which the greater idols were approached and signified that the emperor was a god lord macartney told the chinese legate that he would not perform the kotow unless a high officer of state would kotow before a picture of the king of england the emperor finally agreed to admit the ambassador who bent his knee as he would have done before his own sovereign the editor on the day of audience the ambassadors were ushered into the garden of jiho tents had been pitched the imperial one had nothing magnificent but was distinguished from all the others by its yellow colour the imperial family as well as mandarins of the first rank had all collected shortly after daylight the sound of musical instruments announced the approach of the emperor he was seated in an open chair borne by sixteen men and seen emerging from a grove in the background clad in a plain dark silk with a velvet bonnet and a pearl in front of it he wore no other distinguishing mark of his high rank as soon as the monarch was seated upon his throne the master of the ceremonies led the ambassador toward the steps the latter approached bent his knee and handed in a casket set with diamonds the letter addressed to his imperial majesty by the king of england the emperor assured him of the satisfaction he felt at the testimony which his britannic majesty gave him of his esteem and good-will in sending him an embassy with a letter and rare presents that he on his part entertained sentiments of the same kind toward the sovereign of great britain and hoped that harmony would always be maintained between their respective subjects he then presented to the ambassador a stone sceptre whilst he graciously received the private presence of the principal personages of the embassy he was perfectly good-humoured and especially pleased with the son of sir g staunton who talked a little chinese and received as a token of imperial favour a yellow plain tobacco pouch with the figure of the five-clawed dragon embroidered upon it afterward the ambassadors from burma and little bukharia were introduced and performed the nine prostrations a sumptuous banquet was then served up and after their departure they had presents sent to them consisting of silks porcelain and teas upon an application made to the prime minister respecting a merchant ship which had accompanied the ambassador's frigate they received the most flattering answer and every request was fully granted to them having accompanied the embassy the ship was to pay no duty after their return to peking it was intimated to them that his majesty on his way to yuan ming yuan would be delighted if the ambassador came to meet him on the road when the emperor observed him he stopped short and graciously addressed him he was carried in a chair and followed by a clumsy cart which could not be distinguished from other vehicles if it had not been for the yellow cloth over it 
on his arrival at yuen ming yuen he viewed with great delight the various presents which the ambassador had brought with him a model of the royal sovereign a ship of war of a hundred and ten guns attracted much of his notice in consequence of this embassy his imperial majesty called together a council to deliberate what answer ought to be given to the letter the result of this conference was that the ambassador was given to understand that as the winter approached he ought to be thinking about his departure at an interview with the minister of state to which he was invited in the palace he found the emperor's answer contained in a large roll covered with yellow silk and placed in a chair of state from thence it was sent into the ambassador's hotel accompanied by several presents news which arrived from canton stating the probability of a rupture between england and the french republic hastened the departure of the ambassador he had been very anxious to obtain some privileges for the british trade but the prime minister was as anxious to evade all conversation upon business the splendid embassy was only viewed as a congratulatory mission and treated as such the chinese were certainly not wanting in politeness nor did the emperor even treat them rudely but empty compliments were not the object of this expensive expedition the next english ambassador lord amherst who came in eighteen seventeen refused to kotow was told that he was a rude man who did not know how to behave and was bidden to go home at once the editor end of section sixty five this recording is in the public domain recording by jim lock of floyd virginia section sixty six of china japan and the islands of the pacific ready for librivox dot org by brianna opium eaters by william spear the chinese were certainly the most exasperating of mortals but trade with them was growing more and more valuable especially to the english for in british india there were vast fields of the poppy from which opium is obtained the chinese were fast becoming a nation of opium users the emperor forbade the introduction of the drug into china but it was easy to bribe the chinese officials and the quantity sold increased every year this is the way its effects are described by a man who lived in the country for many years the editor the face becomes pale and haggard the eyes moist and vacant the whole expression miserable and idiotic the body wastes to a skeleton the joints are tortured with pain the sensation of gnawing in the stomach when the private of the drug is described by those addicted to its use to be like the tearing of its tender coats by the claws of an animal of prey while a return to it fills the brain with horrid and tormenting visions like the mania of delirium tremens i have seen strong men when unable to obtain their accustomed dose crazy with the suffering the face crimsoned in some cases and the perspiration streaming down in a shower few individuals of those whom it possesses are able to find a sufficient antidote the subject lingers a few years and a dreary and unpitied death ends the scene end of section sixty six this recording is in the public domain Section 67 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica M.C. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 67 A Boston Tea Party in China by William Spear Some of the Chinese officials urged the emperor to allow the sale of opium. The traders would pay him a large tax, they said, and thus an immense revenue would come to the government, the emperor positively refused. I will not receive a revenue, he declared, from a thing that will destroy the lives and happiness of my people. The Editor In January 1839, the government sent the police to search the native houses of Canton and seize opium wherever found. This led to a curious scene, highly characteristic of the democratic character of the Chinese institutions and the independence of the people. The people would not allow the search to begin until they had first searched the policemen, who were generally known as the greatest opium smokers in the city. A few days after this, the canton authorities caused a native opium smuggler to be executed in front of the factories, whereupon all the foreign flags were immediately struck. The governor took no notice of a remonstrance addressed by him by Captain Elliot, the British superintendent of trade. A week after these occurrences, the celebrated Commissioner Lin arrived from court, vested with the most absolute powers that were ever delegated by the Emperor. When he arrived at Canton, there were several British ships in the river, having not less than twenty thousand chests of opium on port. These, he demanded, should be given up without delay to be destroyed. He blockaded the factories and even threatened to put the occupants to death, on which the British superintendent, Captain Elliot, deemed it advisable to agree to the surrender of the opium, in order to secure the safety of his countrymen. Several weeks were occupied in the landing of the forfeited drug, during which the merchants were still detained in the factories. But as soon as it was ascertained that all the chests had been brought on shore, the troops were withdrawn and the captives left at liberty to depart. In the meantime, the commissioner had sent to Peking for instructions how to dispose of the property he had seized, and received the following order in the name of the emperor. Lin and his colleagues are to assemble the civil and military officers and destroy the opium before their eyes thus manifesting to the natives dwelling on the sea-coast and the foreigners of the outside nations an awful warning. Respect this. Obey respectfully. In obedience to this comment, on the 3rd of June, 1839, the High Commissioner, accompanied by all the officers, proceeded to Chan Hao, near the mouth of the river where large trenches had been dug into which the opium was thrown, with a quantity of quicklime salt and water, so that it was decomposed, and the mixture ran into the sea. The operations for destroying the drug continued about twenty days, and were witnessed on the 16th by several English merchants who had an interview with Commissioner Lynn. The market value of the property at the time was about 12 millions of Spanish dollars. Great Britain demanded that China should pay this 12 millions of Spanish dollars. China had no idea of doing any such thing and therefore war was declared. The Chinese firmly believed that they were the best soldiers in the world and had the best weapons. When they were confronted by English troops and English artillery, and especially when they found that these foreigners had so little regard for their notions of military etiquette as to attack a fort from the rear, and, what was almost as bad, actually to capture it, they were horrified. Of course, such a war could have but one ending. The Chinese were obliged to pay 21 millions of dollars to open the ports of Canton, Amoy, Fuzhou, Ningpo, and Shanghai, 
to foreign trade with a definite tariff and to allow foreigners to reside in these cities the island of hong kong was to be given to england british prisoners were to be released and all chinese who had been in the service of the english were to be pardoned it was agreed that intercourse between the rulers of the two nations should be on terms of perfect equality the editor End of section 67. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna. What the Chinese Thought About English by Unknown. From a paper that was agreed to at a great public meeting in canton behold that vile english nation its ruler is at one time a woman then a man and then perhaps a woman again its people are at one time like vultures and then they are like wild beasts with dispositions more fierce and furious than the tiger or wolf, and natures more greedy than anacondas or swine. These people have long steadily devoured all the western barbarians, and like demons of the night, they now suddenly exalt themselves here. During the reigns of the emperors Qian Lung and Kia King, these English barbarians humbly besought an entrance and permission to deliver tribute and presents. They afterwards presumptuously asked to have Chusan, but our sovereigns, clearly perceiving their traitorous designs, gave them a determined refusal. From that time, linking themselves with traitorous Chinese traders, they have carried on a large trade and poisoned our brave people with opium. Verily, the English barbarians murder all of us that they can. They are dogs whose desires can never be satisfied. Therefore, we need not inquire whether the peace they have now made be real or pretended. Let us all rise arm unite and go against them we do here bind ourselves to vengeance and express these our sincere intentions in order to exhibit our high principles and patriotism the gods from on high now look down on us let us not lose our just and firm resolution end of section six to eight this recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 69. How the Arrow War Began by W. A. P. Martin. In 1850, what has been called an old-fashioned rebellion broke out in China. The leader was one Hung Tzu Tzuin. He called himself a Christian and made his camp into a sort of Sunday school though some of the doctrines taught there were anything but Christian. His followers called their leader Tai Ping Wang, that is, Prince of Peace, because they believed that his victory would drive the Tartar rule from the country and would give the throne to Chinese sovereigns forever. There were neither telegraphs nor railroads in the land. A leader could collect about him a few thousand malcontents, swoop down on a city, add it to his force, and continue without much opposition until one or more provinces and an army of 200,000 men stood at his back before the imperial ears at Peking had received a hint as to the disturbance. For some years, Hung Tzu Tzuin met with much success. 
In 1853 he captured Nanking and proclaimed himself emperor. This was trouble sufficient for an empire, but while this rebellion was still going on, the Arrow War broke out. The Editor In the autumn of 1856, a chance spark at Canton produced an explosion that shook the empire and opened wider the breach already made in the wall of exclusiveness. The occurrence was on this wise. The Lorcha Arrow, a Chinese vessel flying the British flag, a privilege for which she had, in conformity with the vicious system then in vogue, paid a small fee to the government of Hong Kong, was seized by the Chinese authorities and her crew thrown into prison on a charge of piracy. The British consul lodged a protest, claiming jurisdiction on the grounds that the Lorcha was registered in a British colony, and demanding, not merely that the prisoners be restored to the deck of their vessel, but that the British flag be hoisted at the masthead, in expiation of the affront offered in hauling it down. The viceroy, who was notoriously proud and obstinate, yielded so far as to send the captives under guard to the consulate. It takes two to make a quarrel, but no two could be better fitted to produce one and to nurse it into a war than the two who were parties in this dispute. Had prompt release of the captives been accepted as sufficient amends, there would have been no war, at least no arrow war. But the consul, young, hot-headed, and inexperienced, unwilling to abate a jot of his demands, refused to receive the captives. They were carried back to the viceroy, who, in a fit of anger, ordered them to be beheaded. He was a truculent wretch, who boasted of the thousands he had decapitated for complicity in rebellion. No wonder, therefore, that he was hasty in cutting off the heads of a dozen boatmen. At this stage, the consul referred the matter to the governor of Hong Kong, and the viceroy proving obdurate to all attempts to extract an apology, the governor placed the affair in the hands of Admiral Seymour. That brave officer, having lost an eye by the explosion of a Russian torpedo in the Baltic, could see only one way to negotiate. Appearing before the city, he invited the viceroy to meet him outside the gates. The stubborn old Mandarin declining the interview, he announced his intention of calling at the viceregal palace. This he did at the hour named, though he had to blow up one of the city gates in order to keep his engagement. He, however, reckoned without his host. The viceroy was not at home, and the little squad of marines, only three hundred, withdrew to their ships, their daring feat having had no other effect than to fan a firebrand into a conflagration. Scarcely had they retired when the foreign quarter was set on fire by an infuriated populace. The foreigners took refuge on the shipping, and the shipping dropped down the river to Hong Kong. The little settlement at Hong Kong was in no small peril, its chief danger being a possible rising of the Chinese. But overwhelming as were their numbers, they refrained from open action, trusting, perhaps, to the effect of poison, which Alum, the city baker, mixed with his dough. The mixture was too strong and defeated its object. Only two or three died, though many suffered, and it was agreed on all hands that for once there was too much Alum in the bread. This rupture was recognized as the beginning of a war, and troops were dispatched to the scene. End of section 69. Recording by Todd. Section 70 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 70. Receiving the Yellow Jacket. By A. Egmont Hake. The treaty which closed the war was signed in 1860. The Manchus were then free to suppress Hang Su to Suen, if they could. By this time they had learned that the Chinese army was not the mightiest force in the world, and they appealed to their former foes. Major Gordon, afterwards General Gordon, took command, and now the fortunes of the rebels changed. In 1864 they were completely suppressed. The greatest honor that could be shown to Major Gordon was to bestow upon him the order of the Yellow Jacket. Of course this, like all Chinese proceedings, was carried on with a vast amount of ceremony. The Editor The Emperor of China had granted to Gordon for his eminent services the distinguished order of the Yellow Jacket. The number of the recipients of this order is, I believe, limited to twelve, and these twelve constitute His Imperial Majesty's bodyguard. Gordon had received, during our absence from the camp of instruction, 
a notification that the distinguished Chinese officials who were deputed to invest him with his order had arrived from Peking, and were awaiting his pleasure to settle when the ceremony of investiture should take place. A very large force of Imperial Chinese troops arrived and stockaded themselves about three miles from us. Gunboats conveying and escorting the Chinese dignitaries arrived, and an enormous amount of gunpowder was burnt in the way of salutes to them. It was decided that the ceremony should take place at the camp of instruction, and two very large marquee tents were pitched for the ceremony. The day arrived. All the Chinese officials wore their gorgeous robes. The air smelt of the villainous powder that they burnt in the countless salutes and crackers let off to do honor to the occasion, and countless banners and flags of all hues were flying. Altogether, it was a very bright and animated scene. For some two or three hours, Gordon did nothing but put on one suit of clothes, take them off and put on another, and to onlookers it became rather monotonous. The donning of the yellow jacket with all its paraphernalia was the climax of this interesting scene. More guns fired, crackers fizzed and burst, gongs were clashed, and huge brass horns brayed. The Chinese officials went down on their knees, and appeared as if seized with a sudden desire to find out which was the softer, their heads or the ground. After trying conclusions with the ground three times, all got up, looking very solemn, bewildered, and marching about the place with spectacles and hats in very dissipated positions on their faces and heads, and garments very much disarranged. All the time that this was going on, Gordon's face bore a sort of half-amused, half-satirical smile, and, though he hated the whole ceremony and fuss, still he entered into the whole affair with interest, asked about the various garments, and made comical allusions to his appearance in them. Altogether, the ceremony lasted close on five hours. This over, the Chinese dignitaries left in the same ostentatious and noisy way as they had arrived. The paraphernalia connected with the Order of the Yellow Jacket is very considerable, and the outfit must have cost a very large sum of money, as it comprises silk dresses, robes, jackets, hats, caps, boots, shoes, fans, girdles, thumb rings of jade, and necklaces for all seasons and occasions. The outfit sent down by the emperor was in fair size wood boxes, covered with white parchment and the device of the imperial dragon in red painted on them. Each box contained a complete suit appertaining to the order. How many there were altogether I forget, but there were a great number. End of section 70. Recording by Todd. Section 71 of China, Japan and the Islands of the Pacific, read for LibriVox.org by Mona Jahin. China Part 10, Language, Schools and Examinations, Historical Note. A national system of education has been one of the strongest forces in holding together the different races that make up the Chinese nation. For 17 centuries, all government offices have been filled by civil service, examination, and consequently, education is eagerly sought after by all classes. The Chinese language is extremely difficult to master. Words have but one syllable, and the same word may be a noun, adjective, verb, or adverb, masculine or feminine, singular or plural. The Chinese write in vertical columns, using brushes dipped in ink. Writing is an art with them, and fine specimens are as much admired as paintings are with us. End of section 71. This recording is in the public domain. Section 72 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 72, The Mandarin Language, by Pierre Duhalde. 
The Chinese have two sorts of languages. The first, vulgar, which is spoken by the common people and varies according to the different provinces. The other is called the Mandarin language, and is like the Latin in Europe among the learned. This latter appears poor, for it has not above 330 words, which are all monosyllables and indeclinable, and almost all end with a vowel or the consonant N or NG. Yet this small number of words is sufficient to express oneself upon all subjects, because without multiplying words the sense is varied almost to infinity by the variety of the accents, inflections, tones, aspirations, and other changes of the voice. And this variety of pronunciation is the reason that those who do not well understand the language frequently mistake one word for another. This will be explained by an example. The word T-C-H-U, pronounced slowly, drawing out the U and raising the voice, signifies Lord or Master. If it is pronounced with an even tone, lengthening the U, it signifies a hog. When it is pronounced quickly and lightly, it means a kitchen. If it be pronounced in a strong and masculine tone, growing weaker toward the end, it signifies a column. Further, the same word joined to various others signifies many different things. M-O-U, for example, when it is alone, signifies a tree, a wood. But when it is compounded, it has many other significations. Mual liao signifies wood prepared for building. Miao lan is bars or wooden gates. Mao hia, a box. Mual siang, a chest of drawers. Miao tsiang, a carpenter. Mao u, a mushroom. Mao nu, a sort of small orange. Mao sing, the planet Jupiter. Mao mian, cotton, etc. Thus the Chinese, by differently compounding their monosyllables, can make regular discourses and express themselves very clearly and with much gracefulness, almost in the same manner as we form all our words by the different combinations of the twenty-four letters of our alphabet. The art of joining these monosyllables together is very difficult, especially in writing, and requires a great deal of study. As the Chinese have only figures to express their thoughts and have no accents in writing to vary the pronunciation, they are obliged to have as many different figures or characters as there are different tones which give so much various meanings to the same word. The characters of Tochen China, of Tong King, of Japan, are the same as the Chinese, and signify the same things, though these nations in speaking do not express themselves alike. So that notwithstanding the languages are very different, and they cannot understand each other's speech, yet they understand each other's writing, and all their books are common. Their characters are in this respect like the figures of arithmetic. They are used by several nations with different names, but their meaning is everywhere the same. For this reason, the learned must not only be acquainted with the characters that are used in the common affairs of life, but they must also know their various combinations, and the various dispositions which of several simple strokes make the compound characters. And as the number of characters amounts to eighty thousand, he who knows the greatest number is also the most learned, and can read and understand the greatest number of books by which one may judge how many years must be employed to learn such a vast magnitude of characters, to distinguish them when they are compounded, and to remember their shape and meaning. End of section 72. Recording by Todd. Section number 73 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, the United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 73. How Chinese Children Learn to Read. By Pere Du Hald. From the age of five or six, according to the children's capacities and the care that parents take of their education, the young Chinese begin to study letters. But as the number of the letters is so great and without any order as in Europe, this study would be very unpleasant if they had not found a way to make it a sort of play and amusement. For this purpose, about a hundred characters are chosen which express the most common things and which are most familiar to the senses, as the sky, sun, moon, and man, some plants, animals, a house, and the most common utensils. All these things are engraved in a rude manner. 
and the chinese characters set underneath though these figures are very awkwardly represented yet they quicken the apprehension of the children fix their fancies and help their memories there is this inconvenience in the method that the children imbibe in infinite number chimerical notions in their most tender years for the sun is represented by a cock in a hoop the moon by a rabbit pounding rice in a mortar a sort of demon who holds lightning in his hands nearly like the ancient representations of jupiter stands for thunder so that in a manner the poor children suck in with their milk these strange whimsies though i am informed that this method is but little in use at present the next book they learn is called the san tisi king containing duties of children and the method of teaching them it consists of several short sentences of three characters in rhyme to help the memory of the children there is likewise another the sentence of which are of four characters as likewise in catechism made for the christian children the phrases of which are but of four letters and which for this reason is called sitisi kingver after this the children must learn by degrees all the characters as the european children learn our alphabet with this difference that we have but four and twenty letters and they many thousand at first they oblige a young chinese to learn four five or six in a day which he must repeat to his master twice a day and if he often makes mistakes in his lessons he is chastised the punishment is in this manner they make him get upon a narrow bench on which he lies flat down on his face when they give him eight or ten blows with a stick something like a lathe diring the time of their studies they keep them so close to their learning that they have very seldom any vacation except a month at the beginning of the year and five or six days about the middle of it as soon as they can read the Chu, the four books which contain the doctrine of confucius and mencius they are not suffered to read any other till they have got these by heart without missing a letter and what is more difficult and less pleasing is that they must learn these books understanding almost nothing of them it being the custom not to explain to them the sense of the characters till they know them perfectly at the same time that they learn these letters they teach them to use the pencil at first they give them great sheets written or printed in large red characters the children do nothing but cover with their pencils the red strokes with black to teach them to make the strokes when they have learned to make them in this manner they give them others which are black and smaller and laying upon these sheets other white sheets which are transparent they draw the letters upon this paper in the shape of those which are underneath but they oftener use a board varnished white and divide it into little squares which make different lines on which they write their characters and which they rub out with water when they have done to save paper finally they take great care to improve their handwriting for it is a great advantage to the learned to write well it is accounted a great qualification and in the examination which is made every three years for the degrees they commonly reject those that write ill especially if their writing is not exact unless they give great proofs of their ability in other respects either in the language or in composing good discourses when they know characters enough for composing they must learn the rules of the ventecheng which is a composition not much unlike the theses which the european scholars make before they enter upon rhetoric but ven to chang must be more difficult because the sense is more confined and the style of it is peculiar they give for a subject but one sentence taken out of the classic authors in order to ascertain if the children improve the following method is practiced in many places twenty or thirty families who are all of the same name and in consequence have one common hall of their ancestors agree to send their children together twice a month into this hall to compose every head of a family by turns gives the thesis and provides at his own expense the dinner for that day and takes care that it be brought into the hall likewise it is he who judges of the compositions and who determines who has composed the best and if any of this little society is absent on the day of composing without a sufficient cause his parents are obliged to pay about twenty shillings which is a sure means to prevent his being absent besides this diligence which is of a private nature and their own choice 
all the scholars are obliged to compose together before the inferior mandarin of letters which is done at least twice a year once in the spring and once in the winter throughout the whole empire i say at least for besides these two general examinations of the mandarin of letters examines them pretty frequently to see what progress they have made in their studies and to keep them in exercise end of section seventy three this recording is in the public domain section seventy four of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 74, When I Went to School in China, by Yan Fo Li. Schools in China are generally kept by private gentlemen. The government provides for advanced scholars only. But since the one qualification for office is education, and the avenue to literary distinction and public honors lies through competitive examinations, the encouragement that the government extends to education and learning can be estimated only by that eager pursuit of knowledge, which is common to all classes, and by the veneration in which scholars and scholarships are held. Therefore, it is not strange that schools are to be found everywhere, in small hamlets as in large towns although the government appropriates no funds for the establishment of common schools and although no such thing is known as compulsory education there is a general desire even among the poorer classes to give their children a little schooling schools of the lower grades never boast more than one teacher each the combination system of a headmaster and several assistants does not work well in china the schoolmaster in china must be absolute he is monarch of all he surveys in his sphere there is none to dispute his rights you can always point him out among a thousand by the scholar's long gown by his stern look by his bent form by his shoulders rounded by assiduous study he is usually near-sighted so that an immense pair of spectacles also marks him as a trainer of the mind he generally is a gentleman who depends on his teaching to make both ends meet his school is his own private enterprise for no such thing exists in china as a school board and if he be an elegant penman he increases the weight of his purse by writing scrolls if he be an artist he paints pictures on fans if he has not taken a degree he is a perennial candidate for academic honors which the government only has a right to confer a tuition fee in china varies according to the ability and reputation of the teacher from two dollars to twenty dollars a year it varies also according to the age and advancement of the pupil the older he be the more he has to pay the larger sum i have named is paid to private tutors a private tutor is also usually invited to take his abode in the house of the wealthy pupil and he is also permitted to admit a few outsiders during festivals and on great occasions the teacher receives presents of money as well as of edibles from his pupils and always he is treated with great honor by all and especially by the parents of the pupils for the future career of their children may in one sense be said to be in his hands one who teaches thirty or forty boys at an average tuition fee of four dollars is doing tolerably well in china for with the same amount he can buy five or six times as much of provisions or clothing as can be bought in america schools usually open about three weeks after the new year's day and continue till the middle of the twelfth month with but a few holidays sprinkled in however if the teacher be a candidate for a literary degree usually a vacation of about six weeks is enjoyed by the pupils in summer during the new year festival a month is given over to fun and relaxation unlike the boys and girls of america chinese pupils have no saturdays as holidays no sundays as rest days school is in session daily from six to 10 a.m. at which time all go home to breakfast at 11 a.m. all assemble again at 1 p.m. a recess of about an hour is granted to the pupils to get lunch from 2 p.m. to 4 is held the afternoon session 
this of course is only approximate as no teacher is set to a fixed regularity he is at uberty to regulate his hours as he chooses at four p m the school closes for the day schools are held either in private house or in the hall of a temple the ancestral temples which contain the tablets of deceased ancestors are usually selected for schools because they are of no other use and because they are more or less secluded and generally spacious in a large hall open to on one side towards a court and having high ceilings supported by lofty pillars besides the brick walls you may see in the upper right hand corner a square wooden table behind which is the wooden chair this is the throne of his majesty the schoolmaster on this table are placed the writing materials consisting of brushes india ink and ink wells made of slate after pouring a little water in one of these wells the cake of ink is rubbed in it until it reaches a certain thickness when the ink is ready to be used the brushes are held as a painter's brushes are in conspicuous view are the articles for inflicting punishment a wooden ruler to be applied to the head of the offender and sometimes to the hands also rattan stick for the body flogging with this stick is the heaviest punishment allowed for slight offences the ruler is used upon the palms and for reciting poorly upon the head the room at large is occupied by the tables and stools of the pupils chairs being reserved for superiors the pupils sit either facing the teacher or at right angles to him their tables are oblong in form and if much use will show the carving habits and talents of their occupants usually the pupils are of one sex for girls seldom attend other schools than those kept in the family and then only up to eleven or twelve years of age they are taught the same lessons as their brothers the boys range all the way from six or seven up to sixteen or seventeen years of age in an ordinary school for there is no such thing as organizing them into classes and divisions each one is studying for himself still there are schools in which all the pupils are advanced and there are others which have none but beginners but they are rare i began to go to school at six i studied first the three primers the trimetrical classic the thousand words classic and the incentive to study they were in rhyme and meter and you might think they were easy on that account but no they were hard there being no alphabet in the chinese language each word had to be learned by itself at first all that was required of me was to learn the name of the character and to recognize it again writing was learned by copying from a form written by the teacher the form being laid under the thin paper on which the copying was to be done the thing i had to do was to make all the strokes exactly as the teacher had made them it was a very tedious operation i finished the three primers in about a year not knowing what i was really studying the spoken language of china has outgrown the written that is we no longer speak as we write the difference is like that between the english of to-day and that of chaucer's time i then took up the great learning written by a disciple of confucius and then the doctrine of the mean by the grandson of confucius these textbooks are rather hard to understand sometimes even in the hands of older folks for they are treatises on learning and philosophy i then passed on to the life and sayings of confucius known as the confucian analects to the american scholars these books were to be followed by the life and sayings of minutius and the five kings five classics consisting of books of history divination universal etiquette odes and the spring and autumn a brief and abstract chronicle of the times by confucius i had to learn all my lessons by rote commit them to memory for recitation the day following we read from the top right hand corner downwards and then begin at the top with the next line and so on moreover we begin to read from what seems to you the end of the book all studying must be done aloud the louder you speak or shriek the more credit you get as a student it is the only way by which chinese teachers make sure that their pupils are not thinking of something else or are not playing under the desks now let me take you into the school where i struggled with the chinese written language for three years oh those hard characters which refused to yield their meaning to me but i gradually learned to make and to recognize their forms as well as their names this school was in the ancestral hall of my clan and was like the one i have described there were about a dozen of us youngsters placed for the time being under the absolute sway 
of an old gentleman of threescore and six he had all the outward marks of a scholar and in addition he was cross-eyed which fact threw an, an element of uncertainty into our schemes of fun for we used to like to get ahead of the old gentleman and there were a few of us always ready for any lark it is six a m all the boys are shouting at the top of their voices at the fullest stretch of their lungs occasionally one stops and talks to someone sitting near him two of the most careless ones are guessing pennies and anon a dispute arises as to which of the two disputants writes a better hand here is one who thinks he knows his lessons and having given his book to another repeats it for a trial all at once the talking the playing the shouting ceases a bent form slowly comes up through the open court the pupils rise to their feet a simultaneous salutation issues from a dozen pairs of lips all cry out lao si venerable teacher as he sits down all follow his example there is no roll call then one takes his book up to the teacher's desk turns his back to him and recites but see he soon hesitates the teacher prompts him with which he goes on smoothly to the last and returns to his seat with a look of satisfaction a second one goes up but poor fellow he forgets three times the teacher is out of patience with the third stumble and down comes the ruler whack whack upon his head with one hand feeling the aching spot and the other carrying back his book the discomfited youngster returns to his desk to recon his lesson this continues until all have recited as each one gets back to his seat he takes his writing lesson he must hold his brush in a certain position vertically and the tighter he holds it the more strength will appear in his handwriting the schoolmaster makes a tour of inspection and sees that each writes correctly writing is as great an art in china as painting and drawing are in other countries and good specimens of fine writing are valued as good paintings are here after the writing lesson it is time to dismiss school for breakfast on reassembling the lesson for the day is explained to each one separately the teacher reads it over and the pupil repeats it after him several times until he gets the majority of the words learned he then returns to his desk and shouts anew to get the lesson fixed in his memory the more advanced scholars are then favored with the expounding of confucius's analects or some literary essay after the teacher concludes each is given a passage of the text to explain in this way the meaning of words and sentences is learned and made familiar the afternoon session is passed by the older pupils in writing compositions in prose or in verse and by the younger in learning the next day's task this is in the regular routine the order of exercises in chinese schools grammar as a science is not taught nor are the mathematics language and literature occupy the child's attention as i have shown for the first five or six years afterwards essay writing and poetry are added for excellence in these two branches public prizes are awarded by the resident literary sub-chancellor but public exhibitions and, and declamations are unknown though chinese fathers sometimes visit the schools the relations of the sexes are such that a chinese mother never has the presumption to appear at the door of a schoolroom in order to acquaint herself with the progress of her child's education parents furnish the textbooks as a rule they are bound in volumes and printed usually within movable type the pupils usually behave well if not the rattan stick comes promptly into use chinese teachers have a peculiar method of, of meting out punishment i remember an episode in my school life which illustrates this one afternoon when the old schoolmaster happened to be away longer than his wont after the noon recess some of the boys began to cut up the fun had reached its height in the explosion of some firecrackers as they went off making the hall ring with a noise the teacher came in indignant you may be sure his defective eyes darted about and dived around to fix upon the culprit but as he did not happen to be in the line of their vision the guilty boy stole back to his seat undetected the old gentleman then seized the rattan and in a loud voice demanded who it was that had let off the crackers and when nobody answered what do you suppose he did he flogged the whole crowd of us saying that he was sure to get hold of the right one and that the rest deserved a whipping for not making the real offender known 
truly the paths of chinese learning in my day were beset with thorns and briars end of section seventy four this recording is in the public domain section seventy five of china japan and the islands of the pacific ready for librivox dot org by brianna a child's first lessons by unknown one men at their birth are by nature radically good in this all approximate but in practice widely diverge if not educated the natural character is changed a course of education is made valuable by close attention that boys should not learn is an improper thing for if they do not learn in youth what will they do when old two formerly confucius had the young Hyang To for his teacher, and Chao, too, though high in office, studied assiduously. One copied lessons on reeds, another on slips of bamboo. To conquer sleep, one suspended his head by the hair from a beam. One read by the light of glow worms another by reflection from the snow these though their families were poor did not omit to study young when only eight years old could recite the odes and p at the age of seven understood the game of chess the silk worm spins silk the bee gathers honey if men neglect to learn they are inferior to brutes he who learns in youth and acts when of mature age extends his influence to the prince benefits the people makes his name renowned renders illustrious his parents reflects glory on his ancestors and enriches posterity diligence has merit play yields no profit be ever on your guard rouse all your energies end of section seventy five this recording is in the public domain section seventy six of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section seventy six civil service examinations in china by w a p martin scholarship is a very different thing now from what it was in those ruder ages when books were few and the harp the bow and the saddle divided the student's time with the oral instructions of some famous master each century has added to the weight of his burden and to the heir of all the ages each passing generation has bequeathed a legacy of toil doomed to live among the deposits of a buried world and contending with millions of competitors he can hardly hope for success without devoting himself to a life of unremitting study true he is not called upon to extend his researches beyond the limits of his own national literature but that is all but infinite it costs him at the outset years of labor to get possession of the key that unlocks it for the learned language is totally different from his vernacular dialect and justly regarded as the most difficult of the languages of man then he must commit to memory the whole circle of the recognized classics and make himself familiar with the best writers of every age of a country which is no less prolific in books than in men 
no doubt his course of study is too purely literary and too exclusively chinese but it is not superficial in a popular student's guide we lately met with a course of reading drawn up for thirty years we proposed putting it into the hands of a young american residing in china who had asked advice as to what he should read send it he replied but don't tell my mother but it is time to take a closer view of these examinations as they are actually conducted the candidates for offices those who are acknowledged as such in consequence of sustaining the initial trial are divided into the three grades of siutsai chi jin and sin shi budding geniuses promoted scholars and those who are ready for office the trials for the first are held in the chief city of each district or yen a territorial division which corresponds to our county or to an english shire they are conducted by a chancellor whose jurisdiction extends over an entire province containing it may be sixty or seventy such districts each of which he is required to visit once a year and each of which is provided with a resident sub-chancellor whose duty it is to examine the scholars in the interval and to have them in readiness on the chancellor's arrival about two thousand competitors enter the lists ranging in age from the precocious youth just entering his teens up to the venerable grandsire of seventy winters shut up for a night and a day each in his narrow cell they produce each a poem and one or two essays on themes assigned by the chancellor and then return to their homes to await the bulletin announcing their place in the scale of merit the chancellor assisted by his clerks occupies several days in sifting the heap of manuscripts from which he picks out some twenty or more that are distinguished by beauty of penmanship and grace of diction the authors of these are honoured with the degree of budding genius and are entitled to wear the decorations of the lowest grade in the corporation of mandarins the successful student wins no purse of gold and obtains no office but he has gained a prize which he deems a sufficient compensation for years of patient toil he is the best of a hundred scholars exempted from liability to corporal punishment and raised above the vulgar herd the social consideration to which he is now entitled makes it a grand day for him and his family once in three years these budding geniuses these picked men of the districts repair to the provincial capital to engage in competition for the second degree that of ge jin or promoted scholar the number of competitors amounts to ten thousand more or less and of these only one in every hundred can be admitted to the coveted degree the trial is conducted by special examiners sent down from peking and this examination takes a wider range than the preceding no fewer than three sessions of nearly three days each are occupied instead of the single day for the first degree compositions in prose and verse are required and themes are assigned with a special view to testing the extent of reading and depth of scholarship of the candidates penmanship is left out of the account each production marked with a cipher being copied by an official scribe that the examiners may have no clue to its author and no temptation to render a biased judgment the victor still receives neither office nor emolument but the honour he achieves is scarcely less than that which is won by the victors in the olympic games again he is one of a hundred each of whom was a picked man and as a result of this second victory he goes forth and acknowledged superior among ten thousand contending scholars he adorns his cap with the gilded button of a higher grade erects a pair of lofty flag staves before the door of his family residence and places a tablet over his door to inform those who pass by that this is the abode of a literary prize man but our promoted scholar is not yet a mandarin in the proper sense of the term the distinction already attained only stimulates his desire for higher honours honours which bring at last the solid recompense of an income in the spring of the following year he proceeds to peking to seek the next higher degree 
attainment of which will prove a passport to office the contest is still with his peers that is with other promoted scholars who like himself have come up from all the provinces of the empire but the chances are this time more in his favour as the number of prizes is now tripled and if the gods are propitious his fortune is made though ordinarily not very devout he now shows himself peculiarly solicitous to secure the favour of the divinities he burns incense and gives alms if he sees a fish floundering on the hook he pays its price and restores it to its native element he picks struggling ants out of the rivulet made by a recent shower distributes moral tracts or better still rescues chance bits of printed paper from being trodden in the mire of the streets if his name appears among the favoured few he not only wins himself a place in the front ranks of the lettered but he plants his foot securely on the rounds of the official ladder by which without the prestige of birth or the support of friends it is possible to rise to a seat in the grand council of state or a place in the imperial cabinet all this advancement presents itself in the distant prospect while the office upon which he immediately enters is one of respectability and it may be of profit it is generally that of mayor or sub-mayor of a district city or sub-chancellor in the district examinations the vacant post being distributed by lot and therefore impartially among those who have proved themselves to be ready for office before the drawing of lots however for the post of a magistrate among the people our ambitious student has a chance of winning the more distinguished honour of a place in the imperial academy with this view the two or three hundred survivors of so many contests appear in the palace where themes are assigned them by the emperor himself and the highest honour is paid to the pursuit of letters by the exercises being presided over by his majesty in person penmanship reappears as an element in determining the result and a score or more of those whose style is the most finished whose scholarship the ripest and whose handwriting the most elegant are drafted into the college of han lin the forest of pencils a kind of imperial institute the members of which are recognized as standing at the head of the literary profession these are constituted poets and historians to the celestial court or deputed to act as chancellors and examiners in the several provinces but the diminishing series in this ascending scale has not yet reached its final term the long succession of contests culminates in the designation by the emperor of some individual whom he regards as the chuang yuan or model scholar of the empire the bright consummate flower of the season this is not a common annual like the senior wrangler ship of cambridge not the product of a private garden like the valedictory orator of our american colleges it blooms but once in three years and the whole empire yields but a single blossom a blossom that is called by the hand of majesty and esteemed among the brightest ornaments of his dominion talk of academic honours such as are bestowed by western nations in comparison with those which this oriental empire heaps on her scholar laureate provinces contend for the shining prize and the talent that gives this victor birth becomes noted for ever swift heralds bear the tidings of his triumph and the hearts of the people leap at their approach we have seen them enter a humble cottage and amidst the flaunting of banners and the blare of trumpets announce to its startled inmates that one of their relations has been crowned by the emperor as the laureate of the year and so high was the estimation in which the people held the success of their fellow townsmen that his wife was requested to visit the six gates of the city and to scatter before each a handful of rice that the whole population might share in the good fortune of her household a popular tale la bleue et la blanche translated from the chinese by m julien represents a goddess as descending from heaven that she might give birth to the scholar laureate of the empire all this has we confess an air of oriental display and exaggeration it suggests rather the dust and sweat of the great national games of antiquity than the mental toil and intellectual triumphs of the modern world 
but it is obvious that a competition which excites so profoundly the interest of a whole nation must be productive of very decided results that it leads to the selection of the best talent for the service of the public we have already seen but beyond this its primary object it exercises a profound influence upon the education of the people and the stability of the government it is all in fact that china has to show in the way of an educational system she has few colleges and no universities in our western sense and no national system of common schools yet it may be confidently asserted that china gives to learning a more effective patronage than she could have done if each of her emperors had been an augustus and every premier a mycenas she says to all her sons prosecute your studies by such means as you may be able to command whether in public or in private and when you are prepared present yourselves in the examination hall the government will judge of your proficiency and reward your attainments nothing can exceed the ardour which this standing offer infuses into the minds of all who have the remotest prospect of sharing in the prizes they study not merely while they have teachers to incite them to diligence but continue their studies with unabated zeal long after they have left the schools they study in solitude and poverty they study amidst the cares of a family and the turmoil of business and the shining goal is kept steadily in view until the eye grows dim some of the aspirants impose on themselves the task of writing a fresh essay every day and they do not hesitate to enter the lists as often as the public examinations recur resolved if they fail to continue trying believing that perseverance has power to command success and encouraged by the legend of the man who needing a sewing needle made one by grinding a crowbar on a piece of granite we have met an old mandarin who related with evident pride how on gaining the second degree he had removed with his whole family to peking from the distant province of yunnan to compete for the third and how at each triennial contest he had failed until after more than twenty years of patient waiting at the seventh trial and at the mature age of threescore he bore off the coveted prize he had worn his honours for seven years and was then mayor of the city of tietzin in a list now on our table of ninety-nine successful competitors for the second degree sixteen are over forty years of age one sixty-two and one eighty-three the average age of the whole number is about thirty and for the third degree the average is of course proportionately higher so powerful are the motives addressed to them that this whole body of scholars who once enter the examination hall are devoted to study as a lifelong occupation we thus have a class of men numbering in the aggregate some millions who keep their faculties bright by constant exercise and whom it would be difficult to parallel in any western country for readiness with the pen and retentiveness of memory if these men are not highly educated it is the fault not of the competitive system which proves its power to stimulate them to such prodigious exertions but of the false standard of intellectual merit established in china end of section seventy six this recording is in the public domain recorded by jim locke section seventy seven of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke questions from a civil service examination one how do the rival schools of wang and ching differ in respect to the exposition of the meaning and the criticism of the text of the book of changes two the great historian zi ma tsien prides himself upon having gathered up much material that was neglected by other writers what are the sources from which he derived his information three from the earliest times great attention has been given to the improvement of agriculture will you indicate the arrangements adopted for that purpose by the several dynasties four the art of war arose under huang ti forty four hundred years ago 
different dynasties have since that time adopted different regulations in regard to the use of militia or standing armies the mode of raising supplies for the armies etc can you state these briefly five give an account of the circulating medium under different dynasties and state how the currency of the sung dynasty corresponded with our use of paper money at the present day end of section seventy seven this recording is in the public domain recorded by jim locke section seventy eight of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by thomas peter china part eleven in recent years historical note the war with japan in eighteen ninety four showed for the first time the weakness of the chinese empire foreign nations were not slow to take advantage of this weakness and within the next few years russia england germany and france obtained important concessions and grants of territory resentment at these proceedings resulted in the formation in nineteen hundred of a society known as the boxers or fist of righteous harmony for the destruction of all foreigners secretly aided by the dowager empress who had recently deposed the emperor for favoring the reformers the boxers grew rapidly in strength and besieged the legations in peking the siege was raised in august by an allied army of japanese russians british americans and french the uprising was suppressed and a huge indemnity exacted from the chinese government a leaven of progress which had been for some time at work beneath the crust of national conservatism broke forth at last in a demand for a constitution the councillors of the boy emperor promised and evaded after the traditional chinese fashion in the sacred precincts of the imperial palace became a maze of plots and intrigues the demand however had grown too strong to be resisted and on february twelfth nineteen twelve the manchu dynasty came to an end by the abdication edicts of that date it was declared that the constitution should thereafter be republican two days later wan shi kai was elected the nanking council provisional president of the republic of china in april nineteen thirteen the first chinese congress met throughout the land the day was celebrated with holiday rejoicings end of section seventy eight this recording is in the public domain